Welcome to the Contract Law 1 course at the Faculty of Law at the University of the West Indies Cainville campus. Today's lecture is on the topic of offer. Before we get into the details of what an offer is and what the applicable rules are, let's take a brief look at contracts in general. In this course, we are essentially looking at two separate questions. The first part of this course, we will look at the question of whether there is a contract. And then we'll move on to the second main question, which is what are the terms of the contract? What's the content of the contract? Now, in terms of the first part of the course and looking at the elements of a contract, there's essentially four elements. There's offer, there's acceptance, there's consideration, and intention to create legal relations. Those are the four elements that we always have to identify when we look at whether or not there is a contract. And obviously today we're going to look at the first of these, offer. Now, with all of these, we always apply an objective test. What that means is we do not inquire into the subjective minds of the people involved, but we look at the situation objectively. And we can look at a case, which is Kennedy and Lee. In Kennedy and Lee, there was an exchange of correspondence in respect of a contract. Now, objectively, looking at all the correspondence, you'd have to conclude that, indeed, there was a meeting of the minds that the parties agreed to a contract. However, one of the parties contended that that was not their intention. They didn't mean to enter into a contract. Well, what someone was thinking, what was going on in their mind, that is subjective. Objective is looking at the evidence, the available evidence, and in this case, that was the actual correspondence between the parties. And that bore out very clearly that the parties had, in fact, agreed to a contract. So we will always apply an objective test when we ask these questions of whether or not there was a meeting of the minds, whether something was an offer, whether something was an acceptance, and so on and so forth. Now, let's look at the concept of an offer and the details and the rules that go with it in some more detail. First of all, perhaps we should clarify that when we say offer in contract law, what we actually mean is definite offer or definite promise. That means a definite promise by the offeror to the offeree. Now, why do we have to use the word definite? Well, an offer is definite because if it is accepted, the offeror is bound by their promise, and so therefore it is definite. Another way of saying it would be that an offer is definite if it is capable of being accepted in its entirety, and you'd have to say something like, I agree, or I agree with your offer. If an offer is capable of being answered with the words, I agree, then it is a definite offer. Let's have a look at some cases to try and distinguish a definite offer from other types of things that may look like offers, but in terms of contract law, do not qualify, do not amount to offers. The first case we're going to look at is a case called Harvey and Facey, um, 1893. Now, this case originated in Jamaica, and it was for the sale of a property or the ostensible sale of a property. And uh, what the court had to determine was whether there was an actual contract for the sale of this property. And the court was able to rely on the exchange of communication, which had occurred between the two parties here, Harvey and Facey. Now, there's always different possibilities. There's a possibility that the court might have found that there's an offer and it was accepted, hence there's a contract. Or perhaps the court would have found that there was no offer at all, or perhaps that the offer was not accepted, hence there was no contract. Now, luckily, in this case, there was the correspondence, and so the court could have regard to the exact wording of what the parties said. And indeed, they um, sent these messages by telegraph. And so Harvey, the buyer, the ostensible buyer, said, Will you sell us bumper hole pen? Telegraph lowest cash price. Answer paid. Now, whether that is an offer really depends on whether it is definite. And recall, definite means that it is an offer which is acceptable. And if it is accepted by the words such as, I agree, 
then the offer is bound. Now, the question of will you sell us bumper hole pen, I suppose you could answer it by yes. But then that's not enough because we don't know what the price is. We don't know what the time frame is. We don't know the details. So perhaps this is something less than an offer. Now let's see how um, Facey responded. Facey responded by saying lowest price for bumper hole pen, 900 pounds. Now, is that tantamount to an acceptance? I agree. Well, there seems to be something missing here. What's missing is that Facey is not saying to whom they would sell for 900 pounds. They just said that's the lowest price. In essence, it is, um, it answers part of the question posed by Harvey, but not all, especially the first part of Harvey's question, which was, will you sell us the property? There's no answer um, to that particular question. And then, um, as you can see, Harvey then responded by saying, we agree to buy bumper hole pen for the sum of 900 pounds. Now, um, and, and it goes on. Now, what the court had to deal here with is to determine whether there was offer and acceptance, and we're looking in particular here at offer. It doesn't seem on what we see here on the, the basis of the correspondence that in fact there was a definite offer at any point in time. Remember, a definite offer is something you put out and it is answerable by the words, I agree. There doesn't seem to be, especially the first uh, two parts here, um, Harvey asking questions, Facey merely saying what the lowest price is. At no point is there anything that was is tantamount to an offer in respect of what is it, how much is it, what's the timeline, and so on and so forth. So in the end, the court quite rightly determined that there was no offer involved here. Hence, if there's no offer, there can be no contract. Another case that we can look at is Gibson and the uh, Manchester City Council. Here too, the situation was such that the court looked at whether there was an offer at any point in time. And only if there's an offer capable of being accepted, and it is in fact accepted, would we have a contract. What happened in Gibson and Manchester City Council is that the council um, put out a, uh, a letter that it sent to its tenants who lived in the um, council flats, um, stating that they may sell the flats to the tenants. And any tenants who are interested uh, were invited to fill in an application form and return it to the council. Now, Mr. Gibson did exactly that. He was willing to buy the um, flat, and so he filled in the application form and sent it back to the council. Now, between the application form having been sent out and returned, the council changed hands. I think it was the, um, the Tories who were in charge of the council before, and then Labour came in. Now, the policy with the change also changed. That means the new um, council composition um, did not feel as if they wanted to sell the council flats any longer. But Gibson insisted that he'd been offered the flat and that he had accepted, and hence he should now be sold the flat because there was a contract. So the court really had to look at whether or not the original correspondence from the council amounted to an offer. And remember, the original co correspondence stated that the council may be willing to sell the flat to existing tenants, and those tenants were invited to reply by way of filling in the form. And again, as you will probably have gathered, there's something missing here. You cannot, at that point, simply say, yes, I agree, because there is no definite promise that was made by the council. The council merely invited interested parties to reply. In other words, what really happened here is that the tenants, when they sent in their application form, were the ones making the offer. And it was then up to the council to say, we agree or we do not agree. And that might have then um, formed the contract. And of course, um, the new council that had come in did not agree, hence no contract ever came about. At this point, it's worthwhile looking at what we know so far. We've looked at two cases and we've learned a number of things about what constitutes a definite offer. 
And I think we can summarize those in the form of four questions. In other words, this is a sort of checklist that you can use to figure out whether something is a definite offer or whether it's something less than a definite offer. Now, the four questions I would suggest are, the first one, who are the parties? Unless you know who is party A and party B, who are the parties to the contract, there cannot be any offer. Second of all, what is the subject matter? Quantity, quality. Do we know what the contract is about? Third, what is the other party providing in return? Basically, what's the price? That would usually be um, the answer here. And lastly and fourthly, what's the time frame? When is this offer going to be accepted? When is it going to be, when is the contract going to be executed? Um, so all these questions are important in respect of having a definite offer on the table. Because remember, a definite offer means that it is answerable by the words, I agree. So if you need to say anything beyond, I agree, that's not enough because you're still wondering about the time frame or you're still wondering about any particular aspect of the offer, then it wasn't a definite offer in the first place. And so it cannot be accepted and it cannot become a contract. So you really need all these four elements in place. So let's look, for instance, at Harvey and Facey. What was missing there? Well, the first question, who are the parties? That was not clear from the correspondence in Harvey and Facey, because you'll recall that the, um, the second telegraph said we would be willing to sell for 900, but it didn't say to whom. So it was not clear who the parties are. Subject matter, of course, was clear. It was bumper hole pen, the property. And um, the amount was clear in, in the sense that it was 900 pounds, but again, it wasn't clear who would be the one um, paying the 900 pounds. Perhaps the property would be sold to one party for 900 and to another party for another amount, for more than that. Because remember, the question was only, what's the lowest amount? It was not, what's the lowest amount that you would sell it to us for? And lastly, the time frame wasn't clear either. When is this transaction going to go through? Uh, what's the timeline for payment? And so on and so forth. So um, whatever was there, did not amount to a definite offer. And similarly, in Gibson and the Manchester City Council, you can see that um, perhaps it was clear who the parties were, perhaps it was clear what the subject matter was, but the price was perhaps clear, perhaps not clear. Certainly the time frame was not clear because the council had simply asked any interested parties to submit an application form. So there's no indication of when all this will go through when this transaction will be completed. So again, all the elements of a definite offer were not in place. So I think if you use those four questions every time that you come across a situation where you ask yourself, is this an offer? Then you are on a very safe track. So if you can positively answer all those four questions, then it is probably an offer um, that you're looking at. Now, generally, and this comes back to the first question, who are the parties? Um, an offer needs to be made to a specific party. There needs to be a party A and a party B. Now, sometimes there are exceptions, but as you will see in a moment, the exceptions aren't real exceptions. Now, the case I have in mind is the uh, Carlyle case, Carlyle and the Carbolic Smoke Bowl Company. Now, as you will recall, this case was about a lady, Miss Carlyle, who saw an ad in the paper. And the ad had been placed by the Carbolic Smoke Bowl Company. And the Carbolic Smoke Bowl Company basically said in their ad that they had this wonderful medicine, which was the smoke bowl. And if you took that medicine in the prescribed way, I think for two weeks you had to take it in certain amounts and so on, then you would not get the flu. And if you did get the flu, in spite of doing everything as prescribed, they would give you a reward or compensation. Now, in terms of that being a contract, you seeing that ad and doing what the ad says, um, there might be a problem. If we look again at the, uh, the questions, and the problem might be, for instance, with, or in particular, with the first question, who are the parties? Because we know that the 
the carbolic smoke bowl company is definitely a party but if they put their ad in a paper that's really unilateral that's um, them doing it so we know who party A is but we don't know who party B is it could be really anyone who reads the paper who sees the ad the way to avoid this problem in respect of the whole situation still being a contract is to say that the ad is a unilateral offer that you put out there but the contract itself is still bilateral because as soon as Miss Carlyll did everything as prescribed and she still and then she still got ill nonetheless at that point in time you would have had a second party party B so you do in the end have a bilateral contract one between the carbolic smoke bowl company on the one hand and Miss Carlyll on the other hand so just be a bit careful with that that sometimes you may come across unilateral offers but when you think it through at the end of the day when you cut it down you still have two parties and hence you still have a bilateral contract.